In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Andy Wilson. He's the founder of Logic. He talks about the ups and downs of starting from his dining room table to growing the revenue to millions of dollars. He talks about advice he got that people said bootstrapping will never work and what he did and also what his staff did when his company changed directions. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Andy Wilson. He's the CEO and co-founder of Logic. It started in 2004 and picture this, they started a dining room table and by 2008 they were ranked 181 on the Inc. 500 list with a revenue at 4.4 million and have grown tremendously since then. Andy, thanks for being here. Thank you. Happy to be here. So tell us for people who don't know, what does Logic do? Uh, well, now what we do, uh, we're, we're now transitioning to a software company, Um It's a uh, software that's helping dramatically lower the cost of litigation uh, for businesses and law firms uh, by making it really easy to sift through large amounts of, of documents. It's all okay. I remember going on your site and, um, you know, you have just some tremendous information on the team values, you know, everything about the culture. So today we're going to talk about what worked, what didn't work, some of the big lessons and mistake, you know, mistakes you learned from that allowed your company to succeed so people can avoid these and, you know, succeed also. And I remember when I asked, you know, what do you want to get out of this? You know, because this is not your demographic. And you said, I just want someone to start their own tech company because of our talk. So hopefully one person out there, when you start your tech company because of this, email us and let us know. Okay? <laughs> yeah, let me know. <laughs> and I always like to include a fun fact. And we'll get into some of those early days mistakes and then now. But a fun fact about Andy that I was reading is you're an efficiency junkie. Right? So yeah, what do you right. do in your everyday life of why you say efficiency junkie? Oh, man. You know, from getting to point A to point B faster to the way that I load the dishwasher. <laughs> I don't know. You know, my, I can drive my wife, you know, crazy sometimes. But uh, I'm always looking for ways to cut out the steps um, and what I'm doing. And the same is true in software. Yeah. So we want to cut out the steps, too. Tell us, though, go back to the early days. What was the early days like of the company? Oh, um, crazy. Uh, lots of uh, sleepless nights. Yeah, it was myself and my, my business partner, uh, Shin Yang. And uh, we started in my, my dining room, and we had a you know, whole rack of servers, like you know, what you see in a server farm, you know, for you uh, rack. And because it was a condo, you know, we had to run um, electrical all around the condo so we didn't blow all the circuits. And we had to keep the AC down to 60 just so it would stay 75. Really? Yeah, it was nuts. Um, and Shin, you know, uh, he had to stay at my house a lot. And he was basically a member of the family. And my wife would, would make us food and he would sleep on the couch and, and get up and, and get working in the morning. And so were you married at that time? Again. Yeah, I had just gotten married. and um, your, your wife he, must be a saint. She let you do all that? <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, yeah, it took some convincing, but I mean, we got, <clears throat> I did all, you know, all the, the things that I guess most people wouldn't do, but, you know, I got married, I uh, quit my job and started a company and bought a condo, you know, kind of all at the same time, um, but it worked out. So was it hard to convince your wife to let you, like, lower the air conditioning to that, or, or was she just on board? <laughs> <laughs> she was on board, you know. I mean, in let's the be honest here. Was, Tell me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> let's just let's just say she was not happy that we didn't have a dining room for you know about a year. Um, we had a couch <laughs> and a coffee table. So. so, what mistakes did you make early on that we can learn oh, from? Man. Um, I'd say the uh, the biggest mistake that we made early on was not knowing who our audience was mm -hmm. and not knowing who our, who our customer was. So, uh, yeah, there's this 
I, always, I like to tell a story about, you know, when we initially went out there, tried to sell our product, you know, we would go and meet with law firms and we would sit in, you know, in partner offices and things like that. And, and you have to imagine, like, it's, it's me, I'm about six feet tall and uh, my business partner, Shen, he's about six four. Really? And he's this, yeah, he's a, he's a Taiwanese uh, immigrant and he's got like rock star long, you know, hair um, and, you know, his English is a second language and all that, but he's wearing one of my suits. So, you know, he's looking like he's, he's waiting for the flood to come. <laughs> so we look like just a bunch of jackasses. And, uh, you know, we would go into these partner meetings and we would talk about this new technology we created. And we, we talked about how much time we can save them. And we would get laughed out of the room. Um, and we didn't understand, you know, why that was until it was, you know, this nice attorney or partner, you know, kind of puts his arm around us. And he's like, how do we make money? <laughs> I'm like, ah. You go by the hour. He's like, so you're telling everybody in this room that the technology you guys have built can take something that normally takes us 50 hours and do it in five. Why would I ever want to use your service? <laughs> and that was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I mean, it's such an obvious thing, right? Like what you learn in English school when you're writing a paper, when you're doing a speech, know who your audience is. And I had lost sight of that simple thing because I was so obsessed with the product and you're an efficiency junkie. You're an efficiency yeah, junkie. so yeah, I'm efficiency junkie. You're talking about how much time they can save to someone who makes money off of time. Um, didn't really work, so I had to. We had to adjust our our uh, pitch quite a bit. And so what did you did do it. then? Well, how did you change um, it? Yeah, so well, before we changed it, we had to understand um, one, you know, a little bit more detail about how they make money, like why they do what they do, and you know what's what's important to their customers and their clients. And then once we did that, we changed our conversation around to talk about how uh, what we can do can help them and their clients, and essentially make essentially make them look good and you know make them um, uh, more uh, I guess risk averse in some way. You know when they're talking to their clients about these complicated new discovery matters, we end up being these uh, uh, you know kind of uh, engineering go tos. You know if there was a complicated technical question, you know, we were the people that could answer that for them because they didn't have that knowledge so we filled that gap so what was a key feature that you found now that you switched your pitch to not not save money but just increase value for the client what was a key feature that people really loved uh, early on yeah um I, I don't know if it was so much of a feature as it was uh you know if there was a problem with some complicated piece of, of, of litigation, you know, we could solve it because we were software guys. So, you know, there, there, we didn't really come across a, a set of data that we couldn't hack into and uh, you know, figure out what to do with it for litigation purposes. And that became a, a pretty big, pretty big deal. So you were knocking on doors, you were getting a lot of rejections. When did you first to get, you know, first start to get some traction? Yeah. Um, so the, the first traction actually came from a different route that we were trying. Uh, so we were going to these law firms. That was part of the strategy. And then we also had a strategy of going to vendors, uh, service providers that work with law firms that didn't have the capability that we had. Um, and so most of them didn't work out, but we found this one in uh, New York. And uh, we impressed them with, with the conversation. They flew down and set in our dining room and they brought down this uh, very with the servers in there oh yeah yeah i mean again we must have looked like com you know complete jackasses um but we knew what we were talking about you know very technical we understood their problem and uh they took a risk and came down and this was their vp and you know <laughs> chief operating officer and they're in my little dining room and we didn't know what they were going to do but they brought us a set of data that was very complicated for them that they had been working on for weeks. And it was a test run for us. They said, okay, look, you know, we're going to give this to you. You guys, if you can uh, uh, get through it, you, you got yourself a deal. And they were assuming that you know, this would take us you know, a long time to get through. So we're sitting there on the couch watching you know, Mad Money or something when that was on CNBC. Um, I think it still is. But, uh, and about 30 minutes later, Shin's you know, working with the data. And like a microwave, he's like, it's done. And they couldn't believe it. Uh, he so what did he actually do? Like, what did they give you? I'm, when you say data, what is that, what is that data? Yeah, it was a, a complicated set of documents and email. 
that was involved in a litigation. Um, just kind of shocking. It was a real case for them, as it turned out, um, which was a little shocking, you know, from from, uh, from our standpoint. But uh, the, it was uh, they were using a software that they had purchased to try and you know get through the data and make it searchable and uh, put it into a, an index, you know, a, a searchable index. Yeah. And they were having a hell of a time with it. And uh, we, our software, luckily had solved some of the problems that that particular software didn't do. Um, and we we did it. We accomplished it. We put it onto a DVD for them and gave it back to them. And they took it back to New York. Um, that next week, they flew us up to New York and asked us if we wanted to sell the company for a million bucks. And we said no. We want to build a company. And then they said, "Okay, well, here's forty thousand dollars worth of project work." <laughs> and we took that and did some good business with them for the next year or so. That's great. So what made you decide to bring them to your dining room table? Because I've heard people do that. And on the other hand, I've heard people, they rent like this lush office and yeah. they put this facade on that they're a huge company and in a big building. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's... Because people I listening to this start. may be on the fence. Maybe they have a big meeting. Like, should I just bring yeah. them to my dining room, quote unquote, or to a big building? Yeah, I think it, it, it totally depends on your situation, but you know, you, you want to get off on the right right foot, right? Um, and if you're starting off with the wrong expectation that you are this thing that you aren't, they're going to find it eventually. Uh, and I think they have more respect for you too if you you, you have the you solve the problem that that, that they have. Uh, who cares if you're working in a dining room? It doesn't matter if you have the confidence to stand behind that. It doesn't really matter. Got it. I had to ask that because like that's come up several times on both ends of the spectrum. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, it's, you know, every startup's fear is I'm so small. You right. know, no one's going to take me seriously. Yeah. So, so what are some other big mistakes you learned a lot from? I know looking at your site, culture is huge. What's something you learned with culture from running the business? Yeah. Um, I'd say, you know, just broadly speaking, the the biggest thing that I learned is expectation management, mm -hmm. um, and that's true for for customers as well. You you want to set the right expectations with your employees, um, your customers, your investors, you know, right from the get go, and and you want to set it up to um, over promise. This is a delicate thing to do. It is more uh, art than science. Um, but if you can set up the right expectations in the beginning, you know, especially like when you're hiring, like here, here's what's required of you. Here's the job that you're going to be doing. Here's how it works here. Here's how we'll communicate. Here, all these things. If you set that up from the beginning, um, it makes things so much easier down the road. Uh, whereas if you don't, and I, and I just speaking from experience, I, I didn't do this uh, you know, from the beginning. It becomes very awkward. You know, you start to get into passive aggressive. Uh, conversations because those expectations weren't set, and mm -hmm. the same is true with, with customers. You know, if you don't set expectations about when you expect to be paid or how things are going to be done, when things are going to be delivered, etc., how the product's going to work, um, you know, people will will feel that uh, you set the wrong expectations. So, tell me about one of those times where you set the wrong expectations early on, and what happened? Uh, people got fired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what did you say to them that was wrong? Or um, I think it was more lack of saying. So, for instance, like, you know, I, I've made some, I definitely made some hiring. I, hiring mistakes are probably the biggest thing that, that you can avoid, you know, with, with uh, proper um, expectations. Uh, and I've made a lot of mistakes, you know, hiring from not uh, bringing people in to, to talk with the rest of the team, which is important, especially as you're small. You know, you don't want to just hire whoever. You need to bring them in. It's very much like a family in the beginning, and uh, everybody needs to have you know their input because you've trusted these other people to join the team. Um, and I made that mistake uh, before. I made the mistake of hiring a VP of sales too early, um, and not setting the right expectations with them. You know, on on what I, it is I need you to do. I just kind of expected them to do what they just you know hit the road, just hit hit it yeah. running. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, those are, again, it goes back to expectations. Had I talked to them very frank, uh, frankly about, you know, what expectations, expectations I have of them and vice versa. What expectations do they have of me and make sure we're on the same page? 
Um, and with employees, you want to be aggressive, obviously, with you know the expectations you do have because you want to see them exceed. You know, if they're coming in here, you want to see them get to there. Right? Yeah. So early on, one of those conversations where you didn't set expectations, I guess, what do you include now when you have that conversation? What's an example of, I guess, lately what to do when you have that conversation? Like, what's a specific example you could think of if someone's having that conversation? They're going out tomorrow to they need to they're hiring someone what where should they start what what should they say uh well first and foremost i would say make absolutely sure you need to hire that person you know write out like in your your wish list of what this person's going to be what the clear goals that they need to achieve you know on a quantitative and qualitative level mostly quantitative especially in their sales um, uh, capacity um, and then you know when you're when you're talking to them, uh, you know, explain that these are your your expectations of them. And here's what you're going to be doing, you know, day in and day out. And what happens if you don't meet those expectations? Uh, that's where you know the firing uh, process. If you get to that point, which every entrepreneur will, uh, it makes it a lot easier because you can say, look, you know, we talked about this. This is what you're supposed to be doing, and I've coached you on it. We've talked about it, and you're not doing it. So you. You need to move on, and you want to get to that point a lot sooner than you possibly can if it's not working. Um, I've made the mistake of keeping people on way too long, and uh, you know letting them go way too far down the road. Uh, and again, if you make if you have your expectations set up front and you talk about them early and often, um, you'll find that people that are going to be meeting those expectations and exceeding those expectations, and the ones that don't, it's a much faster process to get them out the door. And, Send them on the way. Yeah. So set those expectations from the beginning, and what happens if they do or don't hit those those uh, goals? Um, I remember you saying too. An- another mistake was not seeing an opportunity early enough. Mm-hmm. What happened with yeah. that? Um, I think this kind of goes back to something I said earlier about um, you know understanding everybody's job, but not not trying to do all the jobs. You know, I mean, there's a great book, E-Myth, um, you visited, uh, that talks about that, you know, same problem where entrepreneurs, they know the problem so deeply, they get tunnel vision and they work on it, but they lose sight of everything else that's going on around them. And I had that same problem. You know, I was working on projects, very complicated projects for our clients, and I didn't see what was happening around me. Obviously, I didn't see the recession coming. A lot of people didn't see that. But I also didn't see the rise of cloud computing early enough. Um, and when we, we, we saw it around 2008, luckily, and we started to develop you know, for that. But had I actually been out of the scene and you know, taught people to do what I was doing, um, I think I would have seen it earlier and I would have, uh, I would have done things differently. So- you were doing services, and then you once you saw that big opportunity, switch to cloud computing, so people pay and they can use the system on like a membership basis. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. And so, obviously, I'm, I have to ask this because this comes up a lot: is you talk about someone doesn't meet the expectations, you have to fire them. That's a really hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've got to be uh, you've got to be a person first and foremost, right? You need to have empathy on you know what that means, um, it, and it gets hard. It gets really hard. You know, when you've got people that have families, um, you know, firing somebody with a family, and maybe there's something in 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 their personal lives that's really difficult for them to go through. Um, you know, there's, there's so many different uh, uh, situations there, but. You know, I think so. First and foremost, you got to have empathy, understanding that this person is a person too, and make it about business. Don't don't get into personal conflicts. You know, if you have a, a personality clash with this person, it doesn't matter because when you hire somebody, you hire them to do something. That's it, right? And if that person is not doing something, um, and you've talked to them about that, obviously you have to talk to people. You can't just fire people out of the blue. That's just going to piss people off, and people are going to find out about it. You're going to get a bad reputation. Um, so, you know, in, in good times, you know, when, when people aren't doing uh, their job, uh, you need to be very frank about that and then have tough conversations, you know, one-on-one tough conversations, and do it quickly. 
you know, that's one thing I, I, I recommend, even though you, know, you might have a relationship with this person, uh, you should do it as fast as you can, make all, get all the ducks in a row, and the day that you let somebody go, that should be their last day in the office. You know, don't let it drag on. Um, now, in bad times, you know, when you have to let people go for um, different reasons, I think that's a little bit of a you know, different story. Um, but again, it goes back to just having empathy, knowing that this is a person, and try and do as much as you can for those people in those times. You know, give them severance, help them find a job, be a great reference for them, and things like that um, are, are very important to do. Yeah. It's never an easy thing to do. What no, are, it's never You know, some of the big roadblocks you've run up against in the business, what happened? You mentioned the recession earlier. What happened with that? Yeah. Um, the recession just kicked our ass. <laughs> so, you know, we were going, you know, rocket ship growth and, um, and everything was great. And then the recession came in, in in 2009 and a lot of the work that we were doing is high end, uh, professional services work for you know, very large, um, uh, you know, white glove type law firms and, uh, you know, big fortune 500 companies, a lot of that work just vanished or stopped. You know, some of our customers, law firm customers, actually went out of business. Wow. Yeah. And these are firms that were have been around for like 100 years. Um, so the recession was, this recession was very different than any other recession that we've had, especially as it relates to the legal industry. In the past, everybody thought that, oh, in a recession, the only people that win, uh, you know, good times and bad times are lawyers. Because during the bad times, people are suing each other, right? Or there's bankruptcies and lawyers are you know, winning, right? And in good times, there's mergers and acquisitions, there's IPOs, and then the lawyers are winning, right? Um, and this this time, that did not happen. You had some very large law firms. Howard and Simon is probably one of the biggest ones, and it's still happening. You know, the big law firms are starting to crumble because this recession changed everything. There's this whole concept of the new normal going on right now, and you know, big law firms are hurting. Um, and that they're struggling to survive. And so you know, because we were uh, riding the coattails of those big firms, our business went down, and it was very scary. Um, but I think you know, what we did um, was a, was a, ended up being a big difference maker for where we are today, you know, growing very quickly, um, was investing in ourselves. So we saw this opportunity of cloud computing. We had used all this professional service knowledge and said, hey, let's automate everything we've done and let's make it a cloud service so that anybody can do it uh, and grow a really big business. And that required millions of dollars of our own investment because we're a bootstrap company. So you have two options. You can save that money you know, during a recession, just sit right. on it and hopefully you know, the sky clears up. Or you can take a riskier approach and start building something entirely new. Uh, and that's what we ended up doing. It takes a lot of guts. So in the midst of the recession, you not only just pivoted, but you then were spending all this money to develop what you thought was going to be the future, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And we wasted a lot of money, too. But, um, yeah, we took all that money that we had, we built up because, you know, we, I mean, our profit margins from 2004 to 2009 were, were very large. So we had saved a lot of money. We didn't spend you know, a ton of it. And so we were very fortunate with that. Uh, but we ended up investing all of that into building what we have today. Wow. And we're going to find out a little bit about that changing directions. But um, first, I wanted to hear about, um, you mentioned the move was difficult. The move, you have two offices. One, you started in D.C. Tell us about what happened with the move because you're in California <laughs> now. Yeah. So we're a bit unconventional. Um, you know, it's not often I think that uh, CEOs of companies are not in the main you know, headquarters, although they do travel a lot, so there's some similarity there. Um, so yeah, when, when um, we, we saw opportunity in California and working with a lot of the tech companies out here, um, just being exposed to certain things, if we wanted to raise money, it would be easier out here. Uh, California has the largest number of law firms, that was another big deal. And my wife's family is out here. Um, plus the weather is amazing. You owe her from that server in the dining room. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm still paying, paying back uh, for that. Um, 
So, uh, you know, when, when I proposed to uh, my business partner that, hey, I want to move to California and open up the office, I mean, that was a very tough conversation. You know, there's a lot of argument. Um, you know, it's fear, uncertainty, and doubt, like what's going to happen. And, uh, but we made it work. I mean, it's worked out great. You know, I fly back and forth every so often. We, we embraced a, a remote culture. You know where everybody's connected and we all know what everybody's doing at any time uh, and it's worked out to be a uh, fantastic arrangement we're getting a lot more work done than we've, we've ever done before uh, because i think a lot of people can focus a lot more. so in that conversation obviously it's difficult what were some of the things that kind of got you over the hump that okay let's move instead of holding you back what well were the sticking I, we, points i guess um it was, you know, with pros and cons, right? So, like, what, what are the pros or the cons of, of moving out there? And it was a test run, too. It's like, look, we'll move out there, and we'll give it a, we'll give it a test run for three months, and let's see how it goes. You know, what's the harm in that? Right. Uh, it's only three months. So we did that, and things went well, and we said, okay, let's do another three months. And then things went well. I'm like, all right, well, it looks like this is going to be good. So, you know, why don't we set up shop here and um, continue to grow the business? So, when I asked you before we jumped on the you know the recording about the most painful moment, um, and you talked about changing directions and what happened with when you changed directions. Yeah, um, yeah, that was painful. So, you know, when the recession happened and, and we had you know all hands meeting, and we're like, look, Shen and I are on the same page. We want to build a software company. And we're going to have to hire more engineers, and the career paths that you guys are on are going to need to change. Um, if you want to stay on board, obviously we want to keep everybody because you know, we work so closely together. And everybody has, you know, in, in a startup um, culture, they're, everyone's mostly a generalist, right? Like they're just they have to do a little shit. bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah, they can just get things done. They can move, you know, in different roles and and do a great job. You know, they're Anyway, so, um, you know, we had that conversation, and then within about a month time, about half of my staff left. Wow. Um, you know, including my brother-in-law, who was hired as a system administrator. <laughs> that was painful. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, uh, we lost half our staff, but uh, the people that stayed on board, um, you know, believed in what we were doing and saw it as a great adventure to be a part of, and they're very happy for that now. So they left because they didn't, they liked the direction you were going in and they didn't see the vision for the cloud computing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and you know, I mean, the recession is, uh, was, was, was scary for a lot of people. People wanted to, you know, more comfort, right? I mean, you know, working at a startup um, where, you know, cash flow is always a fun thing to manage and versus the, uh, the illusion of working at a big company and the security behind that. So people went you know, towards those big companies. We, we even had some of those people that left come back and want to get uh, back on board. Um, but we didn't rehire them. Got it. And one of the things I'm, I always wonder when this happens, because there's a lot of, I don't know, for lack of a better word, crap that you have to go through when you're starting a company, you know, obstacles you have to fight through. What do you what what do you think back on from early on that that allows you to strive and get through some of those low points? Uh, well, um, you know, I like to say that uh, you know an entrepreneur has the you know, short term memory of a goldfish and long term memory of an elephant. Because you got to you got to get through things very quickly. So you can't just dwell on stuff, uh, but you should reflect. And you should you should always do that because you can always do things better and learn from your mistakes, but just don't dwell on them. And you know, when I think you know, I can attribute that in myself, uh, being an army brat. You know, every um, every three years, you know, you've got to move and you've got to adjust the situation and make new friends and just kind of reinvent yourself in in some way. Um, and so I, I take that. I know that. It, it can only get better, right? Things only get better. It's very rare that 
you know, something crappy happens and you walk outside and a safe falls down on your head, you know, like that just doesn't happen. You know? like, um, and so I think about things like that, like people have it way worse than me, you know, don't be the lowest me. There's always a, 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 a sadder story. So, you know, just suck it up. Yeah, I mean, you were that's so my, so that's you, my military upbringing. Yeah, you. I mean, you were almost used to just changing directions, just like what happened in the recession. Just when you were moving over three years, you're almost used to changing directions, going somewhere. You're you're there now. You got to make new friends. You got to make you know the new situation good. I guess. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, it's, that probably helped out you know tremendously. I mean, I didn't have you know, my, my my dad, you know, military guy. Um, definitely instilled some of that military militant like <laughs> you're know, working and maybe that's where the efficiency stuff comes from I don't know so what was some of the uh, thi- what were some of the things your dad told you growing up that shaped do you think uh, don't feel sorry for yourselves <laughs> um, you know that's kind of like what I just said I, I remember having a conversation with them about that you know this if you're feeling sorry for yourself um, you always know there's somebody else out there that has a, a much more sorry story and uh, you know do whatever you can to you know, get by he's like the most optimistic person you ever meet um, so you know I learned a lot of you know, optimistic and my mom's more on the pessimistic side so kind of in between there um, but I learned a lot you know about just pushing through and seeing the challenges that he had to go through you know in his military career and, and knowing that you know he overcame those and um, you know, got to where you know, he got uh, and kept getting promoted because of sticking through it. So what what were some other big turning points in the company? You know, you, you talked about when you got that big client in New York and then you now went to cloud computing. What was another big turning point that gave you some great um, results in the business? Um... Well, I mean, related to the cloud computing part, I mean, it took it took a long time to build the product. Um, one, we didn't know what we were doing. We had to learn how to build cloud computing. And uh, one of the one of the greatest things I think that we experienced as a team was when we first had you know actual users using the product. And you know, it's like, what what are they going to say? What are they going to think? And the feedback was amazing. It was so cool. You, know, you get to see like people actually using your product and you know, saying all these all these nice things and sometimes not so nice things. Um, but you know that feedback was awesome because it showed us that what we had been doing you know, for the past couple of years, just head down working, building this this uh, you know, this big product, um, was the right was the right move. And we had a lot of people tell us like that's crazy. You know, no one's gonna do e-discovery litigation in the cloud, all our sensitive information there. We're like, no, I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. Um, you knew and, your clients really well because you did all those, the services all those years. Yeah, it's about convenience, right? Like it was, we just saw it as this is way more convenient and more secure and more scalable than, than what they're currently doing. And we looked at all the, the, the workflow that we were doing in the past and said, you know, this is crazy. We can simplify this a lot. And if we can make a more convenient experience for our customers, um, then they're going to want to use it. It's a simple idea. So what was something in the product that you had to change because you were getting feet pushback on some one of the um, features or something that wasn't working for them? Because obviously a lot, you knew your customers well, so obviously a lot was working. What was something you had to change because of what wasn't working for someone? Mm. I mean, we went through a lot of beta testing just on our own and, um, uh, uh, you know, beta customers. So it's hard to say because we went through so much of that. I mean, now I wouldn't say we get so much of we need to, you need to change this kind of feature. It's more like it would be nice if you would add this on top of the feature, which is very dangerous, by the way. Um, you know, for I think for any product entrepreneur, like you're a problem solver. So when a customer comes to you and says, Man, it would be awesome if you could do this. Um, say, great, good idea, and log it. You know, but don't just like immediately start trying to come up with a solution. You end up with Microsoft Word. After, you know, <laughs> you let that go on long enough. Um, all the buttons everywhere that do every single thing anybody's ever asked. 
so you know that's I think that's been more of the challenge, not so much of the you know, we want you to change this. Um, although we did originally design it to be something that uh, that it's like we what it's used today, like we didn't we didn't design it for that. You know, we designed it for ourselves. Right, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah, so like we designed it for ourselves because we were like, hey, well, we just want to make this so easy for us. And then we quickly realized, wow, this is a huge opportunity for to make it easy for somebody else to do this one thing. And it was taking all this complicated data and making sense of it. Uh, but we didn't design it to do, say, uh, which this, this process is called document review and production. And it turns out that that's what everybody's using it for. Uh, and it's like, oh, well... I guess we have to build more features on top of that to facilitate that need. How did you discover that? That was what people were starting to use it for. Well, so it's a SaaS app, so we can we monitor like what they're doing uh, in the applications. It get, gives us some better insight. But we also sit down and talk to them. Um, you know, kind of a lean startup mentality of just get out of the room. You know, go talk to your users. We do that a lot. I mean, I have a sales background, so it's very natural for me to. You sit down and talk with customers about you know, what they're doing, how they're doing it. When we originally created the application, that's actually how we built it. We, we wrote it out on paper and uh, Keynote, and we sat down with them and showed them you know, images and said, hey, does this make sense, and had them actually mock you know, use it. Um, and so that's how we discovered you know, some of these different use cases, and then we dove a little bit deeper and tried to understand you know, what it is they're trying to accomplish. and what features we could create for them that would you know, make them a lot more efficient for the job. Yeah. Now, what we talked about a lot about you know some mistakes, some low points. Tell me about a high point. What was something that you accomplished that you were proud of and how you celebrated with the team? Uh, you know, the initial launch of, of Logical was really cool. Um, I, that's I, that's got to be, you know, that's that's like so far that's like my life's work. You know, this is, I've been doing this for about a decade. So, you know, taking like all this knowledge that I've gained and then, you know, working with the team and all the knowledge that they have um, and building this this product that solves a huge problem and getting out there in beta, getting people using it, and then finally launching it. We launched it on April 1st of this year. Um, oh, wow, I didn't realize. Okay. Yeah, so we, we were in private beta for about a year. Um, and now we've got, you know, customers all over the country and, and actually internationally. Uh, using the product, you know, day in and day out, and saying really good things. So. so, what's one of the like right now? You've said a lot. There's a lot of information. What's one of the best piece of advice that you'd have for someone who is starting their business now, or they have their business and they you just want to make sure they know this? Um. I'd say, you know, kind of going back to the, the audience, you know, know who your customer is and then optimize for you. Um, knowing who your ideal customer is is, is not always obvious. Uh, a lot, I think a lot of startups will spend time spinning wheels, so to speak, you know, talking to the wrong people. And that time is deadly, you know, if you spend that time with the wrong people. Whereas if you, if you can go out there and focus in on a very small group of people, right, uh, initially, which it'll always be a small group of people. You're not going to create a product, you know, it's just everybody's going to use it. It's pretty rare uh, that that happens. You know, it's, it's generally best, in my opinion, to start with a niche, a niche group audience, and then try and grow it out from there. But don't make it too specific, or you'll get to that problem of never being able to you know, cross the chasm, so to speak. You'll always be stuck in that you know, service. So you know who your audience is and, and growing it from there. So what about the best piece of advice you've gotten from a mentor that's been most valuable? Do you remember one of those? Yeah. Um, so one of, our, uh, one of our advisors, a guy named Orrin Hoffman, um, he, uh, I, was on, I remember I was on the phone with him a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago, three, four years ago. And we were talking about you know, development and challenges that we had. But at the time, we had contracted with uh, a development crew to help us build this cloud infrastructure because we had no idea how to do this stuff. So we said, oh, we'll hire these people. And it was becoming a massive cash drain on the company. You know, I think I was spending close to $200,000 a month wow. um, just on outside engineers. 
and we were getting nowhere fast. Um, and I remember Warren telling me, I don't think he told me, he asked me, like, you know, well, is this core to your you know, future? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, then you need to get rid of the contractors as soon as you possibly can. Because if it's important to you, uh, you need to do it yourself. You know, it's pretty rare that you can start a company and then outsource the most core thing about the company to somebody else uh, and, and that be successful. Now, there's some people that can do that, but for the most part, that's not true. So if it's core to what you're doing, uh, do it yourself and learn from those mistakes because we ended up spending a lot of money on these people and then trashing everything that they had done wow. and then learning how to do it ourselves. Um, lost time and a lot of money. But we were better off for it once we um, once we stopped that. Dream. Yeah, that's a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> oh, tell me that. <laughs> I would love that money back. <laughs> what about the worst piece of advice you've gotten? Oh, that's easy. Um, bootstrapping will never work. <laughs> so what made you decide to go against that? Just to see if we could do it. I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are just stubborn by nature, you know? Like, oh, you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to do it anyway. You know, they're those kids. Yeah. Drive their teachers crazy. And uh, we got that a lot. Everybody told us, you know, especially in this business because it's a, there's a major cash flow problem because you're essentially, well, what we did the first five years, you were selling to law firms and law firms are just a middleman, right? For legal services. So, you know, their corporate clients send them data and the law firm sends it out to a vendor. Um, and so you're stuck in this middleman problem of getting paid. You have to send your invoice to the law firm. Law firm has to send it to the corporation. Ninety days later, you get your money. Um, that sucks. You know, uh, what business expense says? Yeah, it's fine to pay me ninety days later. Nobody does that. Uh, you know, so um, you know, cash flow is is a, a big problem. But you know, and, and especially in our industry. But bootstrapping uh, was tough, but we did it, and um, you know, it worked out. Yeah. I want to hear the story about when you and your wife were down to a couple hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, when, when I started Logic, um, I had saved up a, a decent amount of money and, and negotiated some, some good lease deals. I had a buddy who worked at Dell and got some nice deals on servers and stuff. Uh, but, you know, the money uh, quickly ran out and, you know, we got down to just a couple hundred bucks in our checking account, and she was working at a company called Bearing Point, which is no longer their Deloitte, um, they're part of their Deloitte. And, uh, you know, she was making her salary, but we were living off of that. We had this condo, we had car payment, and all these things, and the money was just, you know, draining. And uh, we, we started playing poker with our friends in our condo building, um, and just being very intense about learning everything there is about poker, and because we had to survive. so. We would play these late night games where there was hundreds and hundreds of dollars at stake on the table. We luckily had some friends there that were just fine throwing in, you know, fifty dollar <laughs> uh, pots at a time, and uh, we started making a lot of money off of poker um, every week just to add some more cash into the bank. So, so do you still ever play? I mean, that, that phase kind of stopped. I mean, well, I have three kids now, so you know, it's really tough to play any kind of. So your lesson there is when times are tough, play poker. No. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, be risky. I, I think that kind of goes to just, just take risks. You know? I have one last question for you, Andy. Uh, before I ask it, and this is, has been in my mind after you said that last comment, tell us a little bit more about the business. What's exciting now? What are you up to now? Yeah, um, so you know the business is is really starting to take off, and we're growing at over fifty percent month over month um, in subscriptions. Uh, the market is is huge. Um, our customers are saying amazing things. We're building some pretty incredible. We're actually taking that feedback from our users. So they've already said things like, "This is night and day easier to use product than what they're used to," um, but. You know, you got to keep going, right? You can't just like sit on that. You got to keep going. And so we took that feedback and we started building out a new interface based on their their feedback and making it better. You know, trying to make it 10x better. That's the goal. 
And uh, we've done that. And so we're, we're building that now and we'll be launching it at the end of this year. And so far, so good. You know, the customers that we've shown it to are very excited about it. And we're also building in um, very uh, innovative ways for our customers to get through even larger sets of data all, uh, a lot faster. So, I mean, for, I suggest anyone go to the site. It's sleek. It just functions awesome. If even if, just as from a design perspective, you need to check their site out. We tell people what's the just spell out the domain just for the audio too. Yeah, it's uh, logical.com and that's with a K L O G I K C U L L dot com. Yeah, and in also logic.com goes to. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good domain. Yeah, <laughs> I, I uh, the guy that originally wanted to sell that to me. It took three years to get it. He started at forty grand, and do, 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 got him all the way down to six thousand bucks. Nice. Over three yeah, years. Yeah, l o g i k dot com. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. Yeah, lksi dot com too, but don't really use that anymore. So, Andy, my last question for you is, what you mentioned? You have a wife, three kids. How do you manage being a dad with obviously a huge growing company? You know, the, the kids are a great lesson. I um, highly recommend it to anybody. There's a lot of similarities between kids and uh, just management, you know, tactics and techniques. I mean, the way you talk, I mean, there, there's so many, so I see them every day. I learn something new. Um, you know, everybody talks about put your family first and things like that. Those are obvious. But I think it's, it is true to, to carve out that time, you know, that you need to cut off work and you got to spend time with the family and just be methodical about that. Um, whether it's you know every night sitting down for dinner and then you go back to work, doesn't matter. You, you got to do something like that where you're, where you're with the family. It works for us. I mean, I see my kids all the time. Um, I work from home a lot too, so we have the benefit of that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, incredibly important. Yeah, a lot more important than the business. Yeah. Well, I noticed in your Twitter it says something and. You know, father of three or something like that. So obviously, that's front and center of your, and that's how important it is to you. So I wanted yeah. to make sure I asked. You know, because some people have one kid or they have no kids. How do you manage it all? So I was, you know, I wanted to know. You know, and obviously you're the efficiency king. So <laughs> yeah, it's all this is just driven by necessity. You know, necessity of don't have any money. Okay, let's make money. Don't have any time. Well, let's make more time. Yeah, I love it, Andy. Thank you so much. Everyone check out Logic.com. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Bye.